I mean, our presentation is on infrared photography on um, getting, you know, an orientation to how you do it. The infrared, um, if you look at this slide, it shows you all of the different ranges of light that are available. Visible light is only that part in the middle. You can see at the top, it's marked visible light. This is the part that you normally get with your camera. Um, and it ranges from 400 nanometers up to about 700 nanometers, um, which is a measure of light wave. But infrared films, if you look down below where it's in red, it shows you that infrared films can capture a much larger range of light waves than the eye can see and the normal camera can capture. And um, um, that's what infrared photography is about, is about photographing things that you can't necessarily see. Um, okay, next slide. There are different, you, to shoot in infrared, you convert your camera. You take a normal camera and you convert it. They, they take out the low pass screen and they put in a different filter. Um, you have a, a conversion service that does that. And there are different kinds of conversions you can have. If you look at the left-hand column only um, and starting at the bottom, um, you can get a what's called a full spectrum uh, conversion which shows a lot of color in addition to uh, black and white. Um, and as you move up the column uh, to the super color infrared, um, you have also a lot of color there, but not quite as large a range. Um, the next one up is enhanced infrared, and that is even less color and more black and white. By the time you get up to the next two at the top, you're pretty much limited to black and white in terms of the output that you get. Um, we're gonna show you some examples of the standard IR and the deep um, black and white IR because those are the two cameras that I've got. Um, Jeff is gonna show you the second from the bottom, the uh, super color infrared um, conversion. Basically what they do is they're picking different points on that, that uh, infrared scale that was in the last slide. Um, the uh, uh, super color is centered around 590 on the, uh, yeah, you can see the cursor on the um, visible light scale, but it it laps over into um, the red as well. The, um, the deep um, black and white, I believe is 790 or somewhere around 800. Um, so that it's, it is really capturing invisible light pretty much exclusively. Um, okay, I guess we can go on to the next slides then. Right. Well, let me just, uh... yeah. Uh, say so when they do a camera conversion <clears throat> they take out the filter the infrared filter that's in place in, in cameras that filter out the IR and then you can select one of those types of conversions that Norm talked about and each one gives you a different slice through the spectrum <clears throat> so uh, you can you, you can either uh, Pick the full spectrum, meaning no filter at all, and then you can put external filters onto the lens and and select what range you want, or you can have them put a filter in the camera that selects one range out of this whole spectrum. The advantage of having them put the filter in is you can see what you're doing. If you take everything out and put a filter on the front of the lens, it's a very dark filter and you cannot really see through it. 
I mean, to focus would be almost impossible, um, visually at least. Okay. And then um, since, since infrared is, I mean, the camera was not designed to take infrared uh, image, they, the infrared that is, after it's converted, the infrared uh, wavelengths that are coming into the camera are assigned to the red channel, which is, so if you look at the far right part of this image, uh, this is sort of what the camera is actually sort of seeing. Although when you process it when in the raw data, you're, you're working more in this space here. And you'll see that here. Next yeah, week. well, uh, Jeff's correct that um, when you first take the picture, it looks like that right hand column, uh, depending on what conversion you have had, it'll be, you know, different colored, but, but it looks strange and it has to be then converted in software into something usable like the pictures at the left hand column, or one of the other columns. Okay, um, here's, this is a, one of the standard black and white IR conversions. Um, and you pretty much get black and white out of that. There's not, this is after it's been processed in software to take it out of that red and make it black and white. What you'll notice is that um, green tends to go white so that these green leaves and green grass and green bushes have all pretty much turned white. Um, blacks end up pretty black. Um, okay, and then we can go to the next slide. Yeah, I guess let me sort of interject. There's sort of a, a different mindset that you have to have when you look at the, when you think about infrared, uh, what, what absorbs infrared and what reflects infrared. So green, uh, meaning the, uh, uh, I just went right out of my head, uh, the, the chlorophyll of the right. green leaves absorbs infrared. So that's why it's white, you don't see much. So you, so you guys think about it in a different way. Here's another example of a uh, standard black and white conversion. Uh, you'll notice the sky is a little bit darker. The blues tend to go dark um, in this case. This, is, uh, this was a hay field and um, it was pretty yellow. The grass and all the, and the hay was pretty yellow. Um, I don't think it changed that very much, but the sky was changed and the clouds are more prominent than they they would have appeared to the naked eye. And then the next slide. Um, other direction. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Uh, okay, now this is this this is the deep black and white infrared conversion. This is the the top row of that busy page that we showed earlier. And you can see the leaves are really white um, because it did, um, it, it is almost exclusively at the high end of the infrared scale. Um, and then the next slide, which is actually the one I've got behind me in on the screen um, is also a deep black and white conversion. And again, it makes the clouds extremely prominent and it makes the sky go almost black. Um, I mean, it, this is not the way the sky really looked when I was standing there taking the picture, um, but it makes it very prominent. You'll notice also on the mountain, um, in, the, in the background, all the trees are white um, when in fact they were green. Um, a little bit of that's true in the grass also, that it uh, has turned it lighter than it would normally be. So you, you get a lot of drama with in the black and white category with those um, two 
higher black and white conversions. So now, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so I guess before I get into sort of camera I have, which was converted into what's called a 590 nanometer and up, uh, there is a lot of people use, surprisingly use infrared to photograph people. And it's very popular among wedding photographers who want a really sort of a dramatic, sort of a black and white effect. And uh, what's interesting is, is that infrared actually penetrates into your skin a little bit and then reflects. So the pictures of people it's sort of sometimes you have sort of this ghoulish kind of look because you're, you can almost sometimes see veins in the people's in the skin because it has penetrated. And so the, there is a sort of group uh, of wedding photographers that sort of specialize in infrared wedding photography. It's kind of interesting. In some of the books I've got show a bunch of uh, pictures uh, of people and, and they are, they are uh, kind of interesting looking. But uh, neither of us take pictures of people. <laughs> so, yeah. so now you can get into what's called super color. They said 590 nanometer and up. And because 590 is in part of the visible spectrum, you can, you can get some more color into the scene. There's more data in the raw data that you can convert uh, into the scene and sort of, when you go through this, this, the various processing steps, uh, like in black and white where vegetation uh, became more white, uh, depending on the vegetation here, it gets more of a gold, golden appearance. And uh, you, can, you can play around like with almost probably any image with sort of the false color, but uh, you can get a really interesting variety of looks because if you, you're combining, adding in the color now that you didn't have at the higher end of the spectrum. It's like, there's a, a flower, now this flower was not white. I mean, was not uh, white when I, you know, the actual flower, I think it may have been uh, red or pink or something like that. <clears throat> but the green vegetation uh, goes golden and the flower uh, is white. Uh, now there's a couple of interesting uh, issues when you take infrared, uh, and that is uh, uh, both exposure and focus. So, because uh, infrared doesn't focus at the same point that color, that uh, visible does. So you're sort of bound, you're sort of playing the game of what's in focus and what's not in focus. And, and it's really hard to see uh, in the camera uh, so you, you typically will shoot at a higher up stop so that you're trying to get as much depth of field there as you can, but you still want to have a pleasing image. So you're still trying to, to blur out the background. Uh, One of the things that I have found in focusing is um, uh, my cameras both have live view. And if I set the camera, especially if I set it on a tripod and autofocus through live view, it will, it will focus accurately that way, automatically. Right. Uh, even if you couldn't focus accurately looking through the viewfinder. Right. Just another couple more pictures. Uh, just uh, okay. So here we're normal showing the black and white on how it really enhances the sky and, and water and color, the, the sky goes really, really deep blue, water almost, uh, almost black, and you white balance off of something like the clouds. And I'll sort of step through the process here uh, in a minute but you can sort of get a more natural looking image even though the colors aren't right, but it does look more natural. And that you saw maybe on the second slide where we talked, where it showed the, the columns and one of the column was the, the blue sky effect. And you, you, you uh, and I'll, I'll show you here in a second, uh, the post-processing that you do to get that, but 
you can, you know, one of the goals in color IR is to have more of a natural looking image with a blue sky. And, that, and you'll see how, we, how that's done here in a, in a second. But, but it does give you a nice pleasing looking uh, image. And if, until you realize, hey, wait a minute, something's not right. <laughs> So here's just another example of that. Okay. So how do you process these files to get those kind of images? So here's Norm's uh, black and white. Well, for black and white, um, you can basically just take your image, your red image into either Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw and convert it to black and white. And it works okay. Um, or if you're using uh, Nikon's F MEF files, you can you can also go into uh, their free NXD software and do the conversion um, there, and then bring it into Lightroom or Photoshop for additional processing. Um, it's a fairly straightforward process, um, not particularly difficult. Unfortunately, that's not as true for color. <laughs> Color is a little more involved uh, because you are trying to end up with a, a pleasing, sort of a natural looking image, uh, meaning sort of a blue sky image if your image you know, has, has a sky in it. So there's sort of a sequence that you go through and I'll, I'm gonna talk through it here and I'll show you some pictures that support it. So basically uh, your first step after you collect the image and bring it into you know onto your computer is you want white balance. So I uh, typically will use a uh, white card or gray card and take take a picture of that so that I can use that to white balance the rest of the uh, images. Uh, so I'll take a picture with the gray card and then once I bring it into uh, uh, onto the computer, I'll bring it into the Nikon NXD. Uh, program and use the eyedropper to click on the, uh, the gray card and then use those settings for the rest of my uh, images. And I use the NXD program because it has a much wider um, white balance range than Lightroom or On One or Luminar or any of those programs. And you really need the wide white balance uh, availability of NXD uh, and there's a Canon version as well. There's a, a program for Canon. Uh, they give you the much wider white balance uh, range so that you can correct for the white balance in these uh, images. They save that image and then I'll bring it into uh, Photoshop and do what's called a channel swap where you're swapping the red and blue channels. And this is what will give you sort of that blue sky. So if you think about what we said earlier and you saw those red images, uh, what you want to do is make the sky look blue. So you can go into the red channel uh, in Photoshop, bring up the red channel and you set blue at 100%, you set red at zero. And then you go into the blue channel and you set uh, red at 100% and blue at zero. So basically you've swapped how those channels handle the color in the image. And that'll give you the blue sky effect. And once that's done, you can then just bring it into whatever post-processing program you want to use for the normal, typical kind of uh, adjustments. So to show you what that looks like, so this is sort of the raw image right out of the camera. And uh, uh, this, you can sort of see the, the red, the infrared information is just being assigned to the red channel. It's an arbitrary thing that the, uh, that the camera makers uh, have decided on. And that's, so that's what, that's what that's, this is what you see on your, uh, your camera in, uh, on the, uh, on the screen on the back here, the LED on the back of your camera. And this is what you see when you bring it up in, uh, in uh, your post-processing. And then you can, so here's now a white, white you know, gray card they took, uh, and I'll use this with an eyedropper to then do the white balance. 
and you sort of end up a picture like this. And this is a little darker than normal. Uh, this is one of my earlier shots where I have a sequence that I can show you, but I was still learning about exposure. So I mentioned there's two issues. One is uh, focus. And like Norm said, there's ways to improve on how you can focus an image. The other issue is exposure, because again, these cameras are not, the, the uh, sensors are not made to accurately give you an exposure setting based on IR. So you're sort of playing around with that as well. And uh, so this is one of my early shots where it's not quite as successful in the exposure range, but you can see uh, uh, after you do the white balance, the skies are white, but the, but the, but, or the clouds are white, sky is not, vegetation is blue. So you wanna sort of flip this. And this is where you do the color channel. So I've swift, I've swapped, now the colors in the color channels that I mentioned earlier, now I've got my blue sky, okay? And then you can bring it into the post-processing and you know, do all your little magic to it in, uh, in post-processing. So uh, you can bring out the cut, bring out, improve the exposure, although that's less of an issue now. For, you know, I know what I'm doing, uh, but again, it gives you the, uh, the golden, look of the vegetation, uh, nice white clouds, bluish, but really dark water, sort of a natural looking uh, image. And this is what you're trying to do in, uh, with IR, with the color, uh, 590 nanometer IR, uh, sort of play off a normal looking image. Any questions on all that sequence? <laughs> no, okay. Okay. Norm, you want to talk about this? Okay, well, um, so if you decide you want to uh, convert a, an existing camera, um, there are several places that you can have that work done. The best known service and a high quality service is known as LifePixel. And there's the, uh, their link, and that's an excellent place to go for basic information about infrared. They have tutorials, they have all kinds of, you know, step you through the process, um, talk you through the different kinds of conversions. Um, they also have cameras for sale uh, that have already been converted or that could be converted. Um, so, I mean, that's, um, that's an excellent place to go for basic information or for get, getting the work done. There are other services. Uh, Kalari Vision is another one um, that um, does this kind of work. Um, I had a camera done at LifePixel. I've not worked with Kalari Vision, so I can't, um, can't vouch for them, but I can vouch for LifePixel. They're excellent. Yeah, I mean, it may seem obvious when we say convert your camera. So what a lot of people do, when they buy a new camera, you've got this old camera, right? So what do you do with it? Uh, you either sell it or you can take this old camera and get it converted to IR. And that's what a lot of people do. You know, it, it don't, you don't necessarily need the volume of pixels that you might want in your, in your new camera that you've got in your new camera. You know, so you've got this old camera sitting around. So a lot of people will take the old camera and get it converted. So I have, when I bought my uh, Z6, I uh, got my old uh, D7000 uh, converted to, uh, to IR. And, you know, it's, we could show you what the camera looks like, but it looks, it, it, there's no outward difference. It looks just like any other camera. It just has a different filter in it. Um, you can also um, get cameras that have already been converted. Uh, LifePixel and Clary Vision both sell them. Um, I got one one time from Adorama. Um, so, I mean, major dealers sometimes have them, not, not always, but sometimes they will have used gear. Um, uh, KEH probably does as well, although I've never checked them for that. Uh, there are a lot of them for sale on eBay. Uh, 
uh, converted already converted cameras. Um, they tend to be lower megapixels, but uh, like a Nikon D70 seem to be real popular. Um, I don't know what the megapixels are on that, somewhere around 10, I'm guessing. Um, but uh, the other thing is, let's suppose you're a Nikon user. You, there's no reason why you have to use Nikon for a, an infrared camera. There's no reason why you couldn't go to Canon or somebody else for that second camera because you're going to put a lens on it that works with that infrared camera and you're going to leave that lens on it um, so that you're not going to be swapping lenses around. There is a reason for that. Um, infrared is capable of creating hot spots. Some, certain lenses will create hot spots in your photograph and you need to have um, either a conversion to a specific lens or get a lens that minimizes the chances for hotspots. LifePixel talks you through that whole process. They make recommendations for specific lenses that go with particular uh, conversions. Um, and they're just a wealth of um, helpful information about the whole process. Um, so, I mean, what I have done is I have two cameras. One is a, a lower megapixel than the other one. And I have a zoom lens on both of them. And I'm going to leave those lenses on. I will not change them. Um, but they, uh, they're like an 18 to 200 millimeter lens, something like that. Um, so they, they give me a pretty good range of uh, focal lengths. Is that our last slide? Okay, well, I think I've already said this. Said this. Life Pixel is a wonderful place to get information. If you want to learn more about it, I would start there. Um, you can spend hours going through their information, you know, coming to a deep understanding of, of infrared and infrared conversions and, and how, to, how you might want to approach things. Um, there's also a lot of information on YouTube. Um, you can learn a lot through web searches. Um, and I think, you know, Jeff and I are certainly willing to help out as well if you're thinking about doing this uh, to, to work with you to, you know, work through the issues. And LifePixel has, has videos on their site as well. And, and if you do a conversion with them, you, you get a uh, sort of a free consultation with one of their experts and it's uh you send them images and they sit down with you and work through those images and they record the session they'll send and then send you the recording so it's a way for them to sort of kickstart you and learning of how to use uh, the camera and how to use uh, infrared or how to take infrared pictures so it's, it's really a nice service um basically I mean, it's, this is, uh, infrared is not my main focus in photography, but it's a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, and I, I like making those images. Um, I'm very fond of black and white, uh, which is why I chose those conversions for my cameras. Um, although I have to admit that I'm thinking about getting a super color conversion to do pictures like Jeff is doing. Uh, any questions? Is there any change in file size? Uh, they would be the same. Whatever the camera takes is what you would get. Okay. So that if you've got a, um, you know, if you're using a 24 megapixel camera, it'll be the same as if you were shooting it in normal uh, visual range. There's one other thing I was going to mention. Let me see if I can uh, bring it up here quickly. Did this just switch? Not yet. Uh, hold on. Let me. Stop. Uh, uh, hold on.
What are you? Are you seeing Matt Lightroom? Or are you seeing the slides? Uh, we're we're seeing the slides. Okay, you may need to close. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hold hold on for a second. I was going to try to show. Uh, I can find it in Lightroom quick or not. So while he's doing that, you can you have to go with the black or white or the color. Uh, if you do the color, you can get black and white out of it. I think the right. super the super color um, is the most versatile of the conversions because you can either get the color pictures like Jeff was doing. You can get black and white. It won't be as dramatic as the, the deep black and white conversion, but you can get black and white. Okay. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out what to do with my little Canon Rebel. That might be a good... Yeah, it would be it be a lot of fun. Yeah. Another toy. <laughs> you know, we all need them. I know. <laughs> well, shoot. Okay. You may need to close uh well no, I'm just well I'd like to find the image I wanted to show you first. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we don't have to do it. I mean uh, I was gonna show is that you can re you can really have a lot of control over the uh, the images, over the colors. So you could really swap the colors a lot. And I, I, don't know, I can't find them. Oh, here we go. I found it. Hold it. So let me okay. Get... There's the image, Steve. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. All right. So now you're seeing uh, Lightroom? Yes. So there's the same image I showed. So here's the one I showed you before. So here's just doing another channel swap or, you know, or going in and changing the background. And I actually had another one, I'm not sure where it is, a different color, but you get the idea. So you can actually go in and, and play around now with the colors and make them anything you want, really. Is that where you do the channel swap? Well, I, I've been doing it in Photoshop, and okay. uh, uh, but but uh, on one Photo Raw and Lightroom both have have now put channel swapping into their program, so you probably can do it there as well. Okay. I'm not sure about Luminar, But uh, you can get all kinds are, of interesting pictures. Are there ways to do infrared through software rather than a camera conversion, even if it's not quite the same? I believe there are some um, profiles in some of the processing packages, not, not Photoshop necessarily, but I think on one might actually, or, or possibly Luminar, have a, um, a template that approximates it but it wouldn't be anywhere near as good as doing it uh, in camera. I'm just sort of showing you some different ways, you know, playing around with the channel swap, what the, I mentioned you do like a blue, a 100% red zero. Well, nothing to say, you can't change those percentages. So if you start playing with the percentages, you can sort of change the intensity of some of those colors. So here's one, for example, that's a little more pink. So it's a lot of fun to go in and, and, and I'm sure you can do similar things with the regular color image. You just haven't done that, but with the color IR, it's sort of fun to go in and play around with the, with the numbers. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. Rooms, man. <laughs> anyway, well, that's all I got. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I had one. Yes. When you um, decide to go out and take pictures, what motivates you to take the IR, or do you take that along all the time, or you know, what's the thought process? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, I I usually set out with. I, I don't always carry it with me. Um, I would probably only do it during the spring or summer when there are green leaves. 
um, in the wintertime with the deep black and white, it isn't going to do anything um, except possibly in the sky. Um, so it's a seasonal thing for me. And I will set out saying today I would like to do some IR mm -hmm. and, and, and then work with that camera specifically rather, rather than, uh, you know, carrying it along just for happenstance. Right. Well, I, I usually, well, I have a, I bought a little belt clip from uh, Peak, Peak Design, I guess Peak Design. Yeah. Uh, that it goes on your belt and clips, and also there's a part that goes on the bottom of the camera. So I can clip the IR camera to my belt while I have my regular uh, Z6 on the strap or across my chest. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, a lot of times I'll shoot both. So I'll take some color and then I'll, I'll say, oh, that might be an interesting shot in IR and I'll take some IR as well. So I don't do that all the time, but uh, if I know I'm going to be walking around taking different kind of pictures, I'll clip the IR camera on my belt, carry it around. Thanks. Any more? <laughs> well, I want to remind you uh, the meeting next Monday on night photography. Um, and uh, if you haven't yet voted for the competition, um, the scoring is due by this Friday, and we will have our next skills session uh, the first Monday of March, March 8th. That's not the first Monday. It's the second Monday, but anyway, it'll be March 8th, um, and Ryan Wilson will be talking about masking. Here's a shot when you forget to bring your gray card with you, but the end of your sneaker <laughs> is white. <laughs> so there's a uh, emergency white card. <laughs> All right, enough of that. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> so. Thank you okay, guys a lot. Well, that was interesting. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks everybody, and we'll yeah. see you next Monday. No, thank you and Jeff for doing that. That really was very, very interesting. Yeah.